So hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I am a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Joining me in conversation today is Mr. George Deitch, the Executive Director of the Hagen History Center. Uh, George has co-founded several historical organizations related to the Civil War and the War of 1812 in Erie. He's also helped create the flagship Niagara League, which played a central role in reconstructing the U.S. Brig Niagara and creating the Erie Maritime Museum. An historian and an author, he annually teaches history courses at Chautauqua Institution and for more than three decades has given numerous presentations on Civil War history across seven states as well as the District of Columbia. He's been published in numerous journals and has served uh, as a consultant to the National Geographic magazine for its Civil War Susquecentennial issue. Uh, he earned a degree in history from Mercyhurst University and was also educated at Georgetown University Foreign Service. in Illinois, which was his third uh, place of residence. He left home at the age of 21 once he was able to do so. Um, he arrived in New Salem uh, in 1831. He worked as a laborer, worked as a store clerk, but he was a, he was a young man on the move. He was elected to the state legislator, legislature um, three years after he arrived in New Salem and was appointed to be postmaster, which at that time was a very um, sought after patronage job. Um, most of uh, the early sources on Lincoln uh, were from his law partner, William Herndon. Herndon's Lincoln, if you really want to look at uh, original sources, um, Herndon's Lincoln is, is, a, is a very fascinating book for any of you who are interested. Uh, the photograph that you see is about the time of his wedding. Um, it's the earliest authenticated photograph that we have of Lincoln. And you'll see for both Lincoln and Tawny as we go through these slides, um, you'll see them progress in age um, that would be along the same uh, time, uh, ages and timeline as we go. Um, while he was postmaster, he read the law. He didn't go to law school. As a matter of fact, he, he barely went to school at all. Um, he was admitted to the bar in 1837. Uh, he took a step forward and moved to the state capital, Springfield, where he met Mary Todd, who would become his wife. This is something that a lot of people don't know, but he was a very skilled practitioner. He was no rustic lawyer. He rode the circuit. He tried over 5,000 cases. Um, there's now over 100,000 uh, documents online from his law career, and that project is ongoing. And um, he developed close ties with other circuit writers, including um, the man that he, one of the men that he would appoint later to the Supreme Court. Um, he was very active politically. He wrote over 200 op-eds for the Springfield newspaper. He was a Whig politician. Usually I go into a long explanation about Whigs, but they were part of the group that ultimately would form the Republican Party, at least the Northern Whigs. He was elected to Congress for one term, but he was not one of those um, uh, go along to get along guys, and so he, he failed to be renominated by his own party, after which he took a five-year political hiatus, continuing to practice law, and he re-entered uh, politics as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And we'll get into that a little bit more, but the key um, issue there was um, the fact that uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed the territories to select whether they would come in as uh, free states or slave states, uh, depending on a popular vote. Um, and uh, when he did reemerge, he reemerged with political maturity. Roger Brooke Taney, and it is not Taney, it is Taney, um, is polar opposite of Lincoln. He was born in 18, or 1777, much older than Lincoln, in Calvert County, Maryland, a slaveholding family, a prosperous slaveholding family. 
Um, however, as the second son, he was not likely to inherit um, much property, including slaves. So he went to college, graduated first in his class at Dickinson College in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, he became a very successful attorney. Um, he married um, the sister of Francis Scott Key of the um, Star Spangled Banner fame. fame. Um, he though did own a couple of slaves of his own, which he freed in uh, 1818. And um, he also, in one of the cases as a lawyer, he uh, staunchly defended a uh, Maryland clergyman who had been arrested for preaching abolition. And that was illegal to do in the state of Maryland. There was no, uh, the first amendment to the constitution, which again, I get into a lot deeper, um, was applied to the federal government, not necessarily to the states, especially at this time. So you could be arrested if you violated a state law on speech. Um, so he, uh, he became famous in some ways and infamous in Maryland, which was a slave state for defending this Methodist minister, and he got him off. Um, by 1824, he became a, a staunch follower of Andrew uh, Jackson, um, populist president, the first of the populist presidents. And um, in 1827, he was elected the Maryland Attorney General. So you can see he's a young man on the move. Um, Jackson appointed him as the acting Secretary of War in 1831. And um, in 1831 to 33, he was the United States Attorney General. He generally supported pro-slavery state laws with restrictions on uh, black citizenship and travel in the South. Um, he was appointed by Jackson in 1833 during the banking crisis as the um, Secretary of the Treasury while the Congress was out, so it was a recess appointment. As a result, he withdrew the federal money from the second U.S. bank, which caused it to fail. However, that was a very uh, controversial move. Um, the Senate was not firmly in Jackson's hands. And so um, when they returned um, for the next session, he failed to be confirmed by the Senate. Um, that was actually the first cabinet officer nominee that was ever uh, failed confirmation. Um, he also, uh, Jackson then turned and uh, nominated but rejected uh, Taney for Associate Supreme Court Justice in 1835. Finally, in 1836, the Jacksonians gained control of the Senate, and Taney was confirmed as Chief Justice after the death of the long servant John Marshall. Um, and he would become, interestingly enough, the first Catholic on the court. During his court, which ran from 1836 to 1864, the second longest serving Chief Justice, he was a strong supporter of the original intent of the framers. He would often say, that um, there was a remedy uh, to uh, change the interpretation of the Constitution, and that was to uh, do an amendment. So he was, he was consistently against reinterpreting the intent of the framers, um, sticking with uh, insisting that um, an amendment to the Constitution was the vehicle. Um, he often backed states' rights as a result. He did believe in economic nationalism, um, you know, uh, rights of way, and again, whole, long story there, but he did, there was some, um, uh, some nationalistic in, uh, rulings in, on his behalf. And um, the country had always had the issue of slavery from the time of the Constitutional Convention on as an issue, but it, it grew dramatically, um, uh, the controversy during the uh, Taney's tenure on the court. So Lincoln actually argued once in front of Taney. Um, he was admitted to practice in front of the court. He argued a case. Um, frankly, he had uh, precedent on his side, but Taney, who ruled for a narrow majority, ruled against Lincoln's position. And that was the only case that Lincoln ever presented in front of the Supreme Court. So back in 1849, well before the Civil War, the two of them crossed paths for the first time Lincoln is an outgoing congressman and uh, uh, lawyer in front of the court, um, and of course, Tony sitting as chief justice. So that was the first time they really crossed paths. And, and George, 
with them crossing paths, uh, give us a sense of how recognized that would have been on the national stage. The, 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 the where, the when, and the how. How conscious would, would American citizens have been of, of this crossing of the paths the first time? Probably not much. The, uh, the Lewis case was a case um, over contracts and changing state law. It was a very technical case. And um, it uh, wouldn't have risen to uh, a lot of national prominence. Um, and, um, you know, obviously it had a great impact on Lincoln, um, but it was just one of many, many cases that Tawny heard. Um, and I don't know, I've never really read anything from Tawny about that. Um, but it, I would assume that it was just one of 30 years of cases and he didn't really, it didn't stick out to him as it would uh, Lincoln, who's uh, the only case that he ever argued in front of the court. So George, right there on the screen, you, you have uh, slavery issues in the constitution. Both men, you know, while they have their differences, you know, they're, they're strong constitutional lawyers. It, slavery in the constitution though, walk us through the issues from the moral and legal perspectives. Well, from the legal perspective, um, there is no, in, in the Constitution before the 13th Amendment, which was in, uh, ratified in 1865, there was no prohibition of slavery. Interestingly enough, there is also no explicit use of the word slave or slavery in the Constitution. And we can thank Benjamin Franklin for that. Um, in the Constitution Convention in um, uh, 1787 in Philadelphia, uh, he uh, worked very strongly behind the scenes to influence much of what came out as the, as the written constitution. And he went to both uh, New Englanders and uh, Southerners and said that um, he saw something, he was a visionary, and he saw something that um, he said, we should not put the term slave in our founding document. He thought that would be a, a, a black mark on uh, the future of the Constitution. Now, the words around slavery, uh, indenture, involuntary, some things like that, do find their way in into the Constitution seven times. But thanks to Ben Franklin, that word never entered the, um, the, the original Constitution. Um, the three-fifths clause. A lot of people um, who have heard this don't understand it, and I always uh, like to take a moment. The three-fifths clause was counting um, uh, slaves as three-fifths rather than a full person in the Constitution. Uh, the fallacy is that um, that it was the slaveholders who thought they were less than full people and would only want them counted. Actually, the slaveholders wanted them all counted because the, uh, the census, which the three-fifths clause affected, um, the more people that were in the South, um, both free and slave, the more representation that the slave states would get in Congress. It was the Northerners who um, didn't want to count slaves at all in the compromise as, as people in the census, and the compromise was they would, uh, they would be counted as three-fifths of, of a man. Um, on, uh, the Constitution also had a prohibition of the slave trade after 1808 built in, and quite frankly, most of the Congress felt that that was a good compromise because, frankly, I believe Northerners and Southerners believed that slavery would gradually die out into the 1800s. Um, what happened that changed all that was the cotton gin, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, back to the Constitution. The Fugitive Slave uh, Clause um, and the several uh, congressional enabling acts that were um, followed to enforce the Fugitive Slave Clause, particularly in uh, the late 18, uh, the late 1700s and the Compromise of 1850, that um, uh, gave legal um, backing to uh, those to hire slave catchers to go north and retrieve their uh, escaped property, which is how slaves were considered at that time. Um, the Constitution also, and this is, this is one of the real sticking points, um, it, uh, it allowed Congress to control the admission of new states and control of the territories. 
So Congress made the rules, the laws to um, admit uh, future states. And then in the Northwest Ordinance, which was the only major piece of uh, legislation from the Articles of Confederation Congresses, um, that prohibited slavery north of the Ohio River and um, up into uh, Wisconsin and the part of Minnesota that was covered under the Northwest Ordinance. So Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, and uh, Minnesota were uh, very, uh, in the, these were territories at the time. Congress said no slavery in these territories. So those, those are the quick issues that um, are, are about um, the Constitution and slavery. Yeah, I, I appreciate that review, George, and, and going into that, let, let's talk a little bit more about court and slavery. And I, I want to get to one other thing because, you know, I, I know from high, high school history, we might remember the three-fifths clause, and, and we may not have gotten it right, as, as you pointed out, the history behind it. But two, I want to eventually work our way to something else that folks likely remember from high school, which is Dred Scott and the impact that that decision has. So let's continue there. Okay, so... During uh, the 10 years from 1841 to 1851, um, the Taney Court ruled on four prominent cases um, uh, having to do with slavery. They generally, except for the Amistad uh, case with the slave ship, um, the court generally sided with the slaveholders. Again, um, slavery is permitted in the Constitution, uh, it's property, uh, the original intent, and so on. Um, however, the Things were roiling by the mid-1850s. We, we had the Compromise of 1850. We had the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, both of which had um, been preceded by the, uh, uh, by the Missouri Compromise. All of these were attempts to find a solution to the slavery problem um, with Northerners um, uh, trying to uh, uh, not necessarily abolish slavery early on, but to at least contain it and Southerners trying to everything they could to allow the expansion. And, and it uh, began to really become to a head after the uh, <clears throat> war with Mexico when all of these Western states, including Texas, um, opened up. And the question is, are they free or are they slaves, uh, slaveholding states? And so um, when uh, President-elect James Buchanan, who by the way was the only um, president from Pennsylvania, ever elected and probably I would put him at the very bottom of the, uh, of the presidential food chain. Um, he asked the court improperly um, to, Tawny improperly to uh, find a solution, comprehensive solution um, going into his inauguration, which was in early um, 1857, to um, solve this slavery issue once and for all. So the solution came in the uh, uh, Scott versus Sanford case, the Dred Scott case. I um, do a whole hour lecture just on Dred Scott, but I will very quickly summarize um, where, we, where we came to. Dred Scott and his wife were taken as slaves to live in a free state and territory up in the Northwest Territory. Um, the slave owner was a, an American military surgeon and he was stationed um, at Fort Snelling first in Wisconsin, but then Fort Snelling in Minnesota territory. And um, uh, Scott and his wife lived there several years um, as slaves. So ultimately, uh, Scott was persuaded to sue uh, for his freedom, he and his wife's freedom, because they were living in an area territory that was specifically, uh, where slavery was specifically prohibited. So this was the make or break case. Um, Tani would write the opinion um, uh, denying Scott his freedom eventually. This had bounced back. It went, was in the Missouri State Court um, because that's where uh, Scott was originally um, uh, taken from as a slave. Um, the Missouri Court flipped from a 2-3 to a 3-2 and um, is, there's 10 years worth of litigation here. So. Um, Ultimately, first thing is uh, Tawny will um, declare the uh, Missouri Compromise as unconstitutional. Um, among his arguments, Tawny would say that the uh, Fifth Amendment barred 
any law that would deprive a slaveholder of his property, such as his slaves, upon incidents of migration in free territory. This is only the second time in U.S. history um, that the Supreme Court found an act of Congress to be unconstitutional. The first time was 54 years earlier, and anybody who um, ever has taken a constitutional course will recognize uh, Marbury versus Madison. It's considered uh, the case that puts the Supreme Court on equal footing with the other branches of government. So uh, the Missouri Compromise, which said that uh, slaveholding states were only south of the Missouri Compromise line, which ran across the center of the country, um, that was deemed unconstitutional. But more so, that really went far beyond um, just simply uh, nullifying the Missouri Compromise, which at that time was um, almost 40 years old, and um, denying the Scots their freedom. Um, Tawny, in, this was a 7-2 decision, this is not a close call, um, wrote for the majority. And he went on to write uh, that uh, he denied all um, black citizenship, free or um, enslaved. And I'm gonna read you a couple of paragraphs here um, to give you an idea of the tone. And this tone really lit one of the matches um, that burned very quickly uh, to what would become the Civil War. And when you hear these words, and you particularly think about uh, what's been going on this last week, um, there's a certain shock factor here. Um, but this was in the uh, uh, Scott for Sanford 1857 Supreme Court decision. Um, he held that um, uh, people of African descent, quote, be regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they have no rights to which the white man was bound to respect, that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. And then he goes on a couple paragraphs later. If citizenship would give to persons of the Negro race who are recognized as citizens of any one state in the union, the right to enter every other state whenever they pleased. Unlimited travel, as long as you're free, as long as you're a citizen. Tawny is against this. Um, so the right to enter every other state wherever they pleased, singly or in companies, with or without a passport and without obstruction, to sojourn there as long as they pleased, to go where they pleased at every hour of the day or night without molestation, unless they committed some violation of law for which a white man would be punished. And it would give them full liberty of speech in public and in private upon all subjects upon which its own citizens might speak, to hold public meetings upon public affairs, to keep and carry arms wherever they went. And all of this would be done in the face of the subject race of the same color, both free and slaves, and inevitably producing discontent and insubordination among them, endangering the peace and safety of the United States. Those were incendiary words in 1857, um, and you can imagine how that would go over today. So that was um, how Tawny chose to try to put a final stamp on the issue of um, slavery, basically saying um, the Missouri Compromise is out. Blacks, free or not, are denied citizenship. This is how it is. And um, it, um, it, it helped to really blow the country up. Um, the Southerners rejoiced, the Northerners were appalled, even the ones that were not necessarily pro-abolition at the time, um, but uh, they, many recognized the, the uh, human rights um, that uh, Tawny was denying. And, and what a tremendous impact that that has on the nation in 1857. Let's fast forward just a year to 1858. Uh, the young congressman from Illinois, not Barack Obama, but Abraham Lincoln. Tell us about the impact of the 1858 race. Okay, so um, Lincoln uh, moved over after the Whig Party kind of fell apart um, south to north. Um, there was a, a 
a fusion of, of minor parties that came together to create the Republican Party. Lincoln was one of the founders. Um, uh, and in 1858, the uh, Republicans in, the, in Illinois nominated him to run for Senate. Um, the uh, Democrat senator of Illinois at the time, a man by the name of Stephen Douglas, you can see the two pictures there. Um, you could actually lower Douglas by about a full head under Lincoln. Um, uh, Lincoln, who had a sharp sense of humor and tongue. Um, uh, one time, uh, Douglas claimed that he was five foot four. Lincoln looked and he said, he's five foot nothing. So um, uh, basically, Douglas uh, supported Dred Scott and um, uh, appealed to the Illinois voters um, with the real um, uh, racial bias against um, against the blacks in Illinois, um, you know, saying that you know if you give them rights, they'll marry your daughters, and the whole the whole gambit of, of things that um, uh, pretty pretty much the worst of what we can think of today. Lincoln replied for the Republicans against Douglas in his very famous House Divided speech, and um, uh, Ben. We're going to post after this a list of five speeches that Lincoln did over the course of his life, which if you do nothing else, you read these five speeches, you really, you really begin to understand Lincoln. Um, Lincoln strongly criticized the Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, the plebiscite to uh, see if the state would come in as free or slave, and point by point argued against the Dred Scott decision. There was, and um, when he entered the race against Douglas, there were seven debates, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. And the key issues were, again, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the expansion of slavery into the territories in Dred Scott. Lincoln throughout advocated the primacy of the Declaration of Independence, even over the Constitution, and particularly of the founders' legacy of natural rights. All men are created equal. It's just one example that rings true to everybody's ear. Um, there seems to be no doubt that um, from all the accounts that Lincoln dominated those debates, won them all. Um, also had several newspaper reporters who, would, uh, who were basically acting as stenographers, writing down the debates and then sending them out to the Big Eastern newspapers. This is the way that Lincoln really gained national prominence. However, Dink, uh, Douglas won the Senate seat um, because at that time the Senate was, um, uh, senators were appointed by the state legislators, which um, in this case were still dominated by the Democrats. And I think that's a great point in history to remind folks we didn't always elect our senators so that they were appointed. Uh, one of the other things I want to just tap into for your perspective as an historian, George, give us the sense of uh, how different or similar uh, political debates in the 1850s were to what we see nowadays? Well, nowadays, a lot of it is very scripted. Um, and you have, you have uh, two, three, four people who um, you know, sit behind a desk and ask the uh, what, however many number of candidates you have uh, uh, questions. Um, this one was much more free flowing. You had the two men standing on the stage with each other and again, Lincoln towering about a foot and a half or a foot and four inches over Douglas. And um, uh, they would both state their positions and then they would go back and forth and the crowd would cheer or boo. Um, you know, it was, it was much more, um, I, I would guess I would say it was much closer to the people than um, what we do with today's uh, uh, automated technologies. And, and George, I know we're we're skipping through a lot of this presentation uh, that you would be given in person because we're talking here is, is the dialogue. And, and, and so feel free to, to color in some of the in-between here. But I want to move us along. Last I said, you know, we talked about 1857, and then I moved us forward to year 1858. I want to focus on a specific day, April 19th. It's an important day for Maryland. It's an important day that uh, further brings both Lincoln and, and, and Tawny together in, in the great antagonist story that you're telling. So take us to April 19th. Okay, so Lincoln loses the election um, in for the Senate. He goes on to be one of four candidates in the election of 1860. He wins. Um, 
is only wins 39% of the popular vote, but wins virtually every state in the North. It uh, doesn't even appear on, except a couple of county ballots throughout the entire South. Um, based shortly after the election, South Carolina secedes and followed by six other states. Um, Lincoln is sworn into office by Justice Taney on March 4th of 1861. That was the day um, back um, then up until uh, Franklin Roosevelt that we used to um, put our, uh, inaugurate our presidents. And during that period between the South Carolina secession and uh, uh, Lincoln coming into office, we have a, a failure of national compromise. Both uh, Taney and Buchanan agreed that the states had no right to succeed, but the federal government had no power to stop them. So virtually no action was taken against those seven southern states. Um, early in April, uh, Lincoln is uh, president. Um, the South fires on Fort Sumter, which is in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, which is the uh, federal facility surrounded by the state of South Carolina. Um, after that, Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers. Four more states go out, and um, we have a crisis. Maryland, which is, surrounds the District of Columbia on three sides, is a slave state. It had a loyal governor, but a leaning pro-secession legislature. And as you can see from the map, all the train routes from the north run through Baltimore. April 19th, what you asked about, the Baltimore riots. Um, after Lincoln had called for the 75,000 volunteers, um, volunteer units from northern states start to assemble. And uh, a lot of them were militia units initially. They are funneled through Baltimore on, the plan was on trains. Um, the problem is in Baltimore, you have, um, you don't have a through train. You've got one uh, train line coming down, the Pennsylvania line stops over um, at what is now President Street Station. And you've got about a mile across what is now the Inner Harbor of Baltimore that you had to walk or get a, or get a cab or something to go across. And then, um, get a train in the, for the Baltimore, Ohio line at, um, at Camden Yards, which where the Orioles play today. So this first regiment to march through Baltimore, Northern troops. Now, Maryland, again, is a secessionist hotbed, even though the state has not seceded. A mob forms, rocks are thrown, um, and um, somebody, and no one really knows, uh, shots fired. More shots fired. Um, six civilians are killed. Um, the mob uh, continues to uh, uh, attack with rocks and bottles. Does that sound familiar? The, uh, the troops, um, the latter part of the column retreats back to present station, gets on a train, goes north. Uh, the first part of the column fights their way through to Camden Yards, um, including their wounded, and uh, makes it to Washington. Um, quickly after that, bridges are burned, telegraph uh, wires are cut, more troops are unable to reach DC. DC faces isolation. The other thing is about that date, and I often ask this and rarely get a, uh, an answer. Um, April 19th, another very important date in American history. Um, that's the day of Lexington and Concord, which many people believe was the start of the American Revolution. The Southerners viewed this date um, in the Baltimore riots as the start of the Second American Revolution. And so it's such an interesting comparison then in, in looking at it now. T tell us a bit about uh, uh, John Merriman and the impact there. Uh, work us through a, a little bit about what's legally happening um, at this time so we can get a better understanding of that, George. Well, first of all, there is no Congress. It is. It went out on um, March 5th and is not scheduled to return until December 1st. So Lincoln is alone, essentially, um, uh, as head of government uh, without a legislature. Um, he begins to take uh, several actions, um, including, uh, as would later be argued, um, using the Insurrection Act of um, 
1783 and 18, well, there's two of them, 1807, 1809, to start to um, use presidential powers to put down the insurrection. And, um, you know, that ironically has come up this week. The use I was, was going to say that's sounding power. too close to our truth right now. So yes. just, just give us a little bit of historical context uh, for what it was then so that we can better understand it today as we're hearing that in the headlines or hearing that in the news. Well, this is not, this uh, would be really the first time effectively that that um, has been used and it's been used a number of times since then. But what it is, is that in a time of invasion, insurrection, rebellion, it allow it gives the president um, powers to, uh, uh, to call troops, to um, uh, use um, federal force to uh, put down um, civil unrest. And um, uh, that the only thing that has been changed in that modified um, was as a result of uh, the immediate um, uh, post-Civil War era where you had um, federal troops occupying the South. Um, once they were removed, um, Congress uh, passed a uh, posse comitatus, which people have probably heard even this week, which prohibits the use of federal troops um, as law enforcement unless um, the um, Insurrection Act or one of the Insurrection Acts uh, uh, is um, invoked. And so all of this swirls around um, what you're hearing today, and it all pretty much goes back to, to Lincoln and, um, and what he begins to do and um, how Tawney reacts. So Lincoln orders um, General Winfield Scott, who's head of the army, to suspend habeas corpus in those areas where um, uh, they see um, uh, insurrection or rebellion, Maryland being one of them. Um, interesting enough, the order was not made public. Now you may ask, well, what is, a, what is habeas corpus? Um, in Latin, it, mean, it means produce the body. And what it is, it, it is the bedrock of our legal um, rights. Um, it means that the government just can't arrest somebody, throw them in a dungeon and forget about them. Um, it gives people and their representatives, i.e. lawyers, a legal right to be heard in front of a civilian court. That is the bedrock of our civil rights. And Lincoln suspends it. And it's a, it, suspension of habeas corpus is allowed in the Constitution. However, this is where the problem comes because Taney says that Lincoln does not have the right to do what has to be Congress, and Congress is in session. So, um, moving quickly forward, on May 13th, U.S. troops, federal troops, occupy Baltimore for the duration of the war. Now, Maryland does never succeeds, but it is under federal military occupation for four years, the city is. Um, amongst others, the uh, mayor of um, Baltimore ultimately is arrested um, for uh, sedition or treason. And um, so uh, the military... Uh, is in charge, basically, at this point. And on May 25th, John Merriman, the man you see in the picture here, was arrested. They kicked down his door at two in the morning, um, finding he and his wife in their nightshirts. Um, he was a militia captain in the, in the Maryland um, militia and was suspected, and probably rightly so, of uh, being one of the instigators for burning the bridges and cutting the telegraph. So George, a, a, a president calling for the arrest of a Supreme Court justice, not talking about a news story that just broke today, but something that actually happened then. And we're seeing the tensions boil up between uh, Lincoln and Tawney. And we're seeing the absence of Congress, the two of them back and forth. Uh, let's fast forward a little bit. Tell us about the uh, Lincoln's alleged pursuit of Tawney, because okay. we see Lincoln taking uh, some drastic actions here. Right. Tawney issues a, right, a writ of habeas corpus to spring Merriman um, from Fort McHenry. Um, the uh, army um, ignores it. And uh, you have uh, the uh, Tawney reacts. Um, he had sent the, um, uh, his um, federal marshal up there and basically was turned away. Uh, Tawney issues an opinion. Since the president has no authority to suspend habeas corpus, only Congress could do it 
citing the power of habeas corpus located in Article One. Lincoln basically has the guns, he has the bayonets, and he ignores uh, Lincoln's orders. Ultimately, um, or Taney's orders, ultimately hundreds of civilians were arrested by the military in Maryland on suspicion of disloyalty. And um, you know, multiple writs were, were made for these people and Lincoln continued to ignore it. Lincoln acted when Congress was not in session. Um, and so finally he calls um, Congress into session in early July. Um, they will ultimately pass the Ratification Act, um, uh, ratifying what Lincoln had been doing. And there's multiple things beyond habeas corpus uh, around war powers um, that uh, Lincoln did. And then they actually came back in uh, 1863 to uh, vindicate Lincoln on habeas corpus. Merriman was eventually released, but um, Taney's obstruction of Lincoln, not only with habeas corpus, but other issues, um, had so as, uh, to use the term of, of the time, embarrassed Lincoln, that um, uh, there is evidence, and it really only existed in one memoir, which was never published, but now um, researchers have found at least a couple of other positive references that um, Lincoln, perhaps being egged on by his Secretary of State, William Seward, who absolutely hated Taney, um, that, um, uh, that Lincoln would be, uh, that they issued a um, arrest warrant for Taney. Ward Hill Lamon, who was um, U.S. Marshal of the District of Columbia, used to practice law with Lincoln, um, uh, made himself as Lincoln's bodyguard as U.S. Marshal. He would often, in times of turmoil would sleep across the, uh, the threshold of the Lincoln bedroom, armed to the teeth with multiple revolvers and knives and whatnot. He was a big strapping guy. He was at least as tall, if not taller than Lincoln, but he looked more like a linebacker. Um, his unabridged papers in Huntington Library carries on the story. And I'll, I just have one quote here. Um, and this is a much longer story, but it just is. The administration determined upon the arrest of the Chief Justice. A warrant or orders was issued for his arrest. Now I'll say that no copy of that arrest warrant exists. And there are many um, in the Lincoln canon, the Lincoln historians who don't believe it. They believe that Lamon um, made up the story and, or put himself at the center of a story that wasn't uh, accurate. Um, Lamon will say that uh, Lincoln had left uh, the arrest discretion to Lamon. Um, there's a lot of doubt. However, more has surfaced since um, since Lamon's unabridged papers were first um, brought up less than a decade ago. Um, Tawney told others, including Mayor Brown of um, Baltimore, who was ultimately arrested himself, um, that he expected to be arrested. Um, there's a couple more reference to this. So is it far-fetched or factual? Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. I, I don't have a firm idea of it, but I will say that the uh, Lincoln, again, through Seward, the Secretary of State, did arrest, uh, arrest a DC Circuit Court federal judge, William Merrick. And I've got uh, three separate um, pages on this, but the bottom line is Merrick was um, also issuing writs of habeas corpus, mostly to get uh, for, uh, through parents to get their young sons who had uh, been underage and didn't have permission to join the federal army to get the boys out of the army. And this so infuriated the, um, the army in Washington that the uh, provost marshal um, uh, went to Seward and um, ultimately Judge Merrick was um, uh, was held under house arrest for about three months. Um, it forced, finally forced the Lincoln administration to um, admit that it had suspended habeas corpus. And what they also did quite illegally um, and unconstitutionally was that uh, Merrick couldn't go to uh, work um, as a judge, and so they withheld his pay. Um, finally, um, the troops were removed in mid-November, taking this a step farther though, um, the next year, Congress and the president 
working together and it, they can still do it today. It is, uh, it is well within the right they, um, uh, to affect any court underneath the, except for the Supreme Court. There were two circuits in Washington, one civil, one criminal. And it was, they, they were filled with several justices who were um, all of them from the Maryland bar, all of them Democrats, most of them pro-slavery. So what Congress did in, uh, with Lincoln's urging and approval is that they removed both circuits. They just closed them. And the judges, uh, the Maryland judges, no longer had a court to sit on. Then they reconstituted a single circuit in DC to cover both the civil and the criminal. And Lincoln appointed a series of uh, Republicans um, from around the North, um, Illinois, New York, et cetera, to be the, um, the federal judges for the District of Columbia. So he effectively shut down a federal court that didn't agree with him and um, put a new one in its place, two federal courts and put a new one in its place. So you can, you can see that this, uh, this dynamic between the courts and the president um, was, was uh, very, uh, very much inflamed at this time. Well, and I'm, I'm glad we're talking about the courts and when we're talking about the, the legal implications and weight of that, because I, I don't want to skip over the prize cases. Uh, that was a significant challenge to Lincoln's um, prosecution of, of, of war effort. And right. so just unpack that a little bit for us, George, the prize cases. Once Lincoln um, uh, called for the 75,000 volunteers, um, he ordered the Navy another big issue and one that Tawney was, was absolutely against. He ordered the, uh, the blockade of Southern ports and seven ships that were either in port, the Navy sailed in and, and seized them or coming out of port um, uh, were seized. And all these were foreign ships um, doing commerce with Southern um, uh, states. And he did it without this blockade, without um, established congressional authority. And it is actually an act of war. A blockade is an act of war. And hearkening back to my um, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis talk, I talk about the distinction that Kennedy made between a blockade and um, uh, what he did, which you wouldn't call a blockade, essentially cordoning off Cuba without calling it a blockade because it was an act of war. So without a formal declaration of war, a blockade, um, is considered an act of war and an act of piracy. Um, seven, uh, the owners of these uh, seven ships uh, all filed lawsuits. Um, they were put together into a single case, went up ultimately by 1863 in front of the Supreme Court. They were called the prize cases. And quite frankly, my second to last bullet point is the most significant legal challenge to Lincoln's prosecution of the war effort. Had they, not, had they ruled the other way, or even within the context of the ruling, uh, if they had recognized the South as a state rather than a belligerent, um, a separate country, it would have completely turned um, the legal argument and foundation for Lincoln's war effort completely on its ear. As it turned out, it was a 5-4 decision in Lincoln's favor. Now, People will wail and gnash their teeth, depending on if their ox is gored, um, on 5-4 decisions. Um, there have been many key cases in U.S. history that have been a 5-4 decision. And this is one of the biggest. And it, Lincoln barely got that, uh, that ruling in his favor. And, of course, Taney uh, vigorously dissented. When they read it, the results... Um, which they would typically do from the bench, the day, the day they did it. Tawney, who was the Chief Justice, refused to even show up um, for the reading of the 5-4 um, uh, 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 decision in the prize cases. So Lincoln knows that he's on a fairly uh, tenuous edge as far as the courts were concerned. And even though he was able to appoint a couple of new justices, as you can see, the court was still divided. So what did Lincoln do 
um, 80 years before Franklin Roosevelt is credited with coming up with the idea and failing to do so, Lincoln actually packed the court. He added a 10th circuit, um, pushing through Nevada's statehood early so he could create a circuit out in, on the West Coast from um, three states now and um, uh, created a 10th justice. And um, uh, he did that to help ensure that his executive orders and his Civil War era laws would not be overturned. Um, at the same time, there are plans in Congress, which was solemnly controlled by what was considered the radical Republicans in, in Congress, um, to force the retirement of aging federal, i.e. Democratic judges. Um, their you know, constitution states that you get these, uh, you can be a judge for life as a federal judge. Um, Congress was, um, uh, had put together a plan to force their retirement. Ultimately, the scheme was dropped, but for, um, uh, for the immediate Civil War, the end of the Civil War years and, and after that, there was a 10th tenth, tenth judge. And um, after uh, a retirement, um, they, it dropped back to nine and um, the court was reorganized later, but um, Lincoln packed the court and he did it to um, uh, get over um, any potential uh, hurdles that the Supreme Court could throw them. Well, and, and George, as I'm, I'm looking at this presentation and, I, and I, there's so much to unpack uh, and I, I, quickly, if we can go through more legal conflicts, but I, I wanna get to a monumental year for these two individuals uh, 1864, when okay. in fact we see uh, the death of Tawny. So take us through. Right. So basically there were uh, several other uh, issues that were um, likely to come before the court. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, that was a War Powers Act and um, uh, it um, was controversial. Um, it wasn't until the 13th Amendment was ratified uh, that uh, slaves could be legally um, freed, uh, the Conscription Act, um, paper money, the use of greenbacks, legal tender. Um, that eventually in 1867 was overturned. Um, Tawny worked on briefs during this period um, for, to, for those issues. He was already writing opinions, even though the court had, uh, had never heard those cases. Um, though Lincoln did have uh, continued strong backing of Congress and generally ignored Tawny. Um, his influence faded after Merriman and the prize cases. Uh, the new associate justices left Tawny often in the minority. He suffered from illness and advancing age. Um, in his apartment, um, his townhouse in Georgetown, his bed was surrounded by pure articles, briefs, and boxes of cigars. Um, he had fallen into poverty, and then at the age of 87, he died in October 13th of 1864. Um, so this man who uh, was considered for decades the second most powerful man in Washington um, uh, faded away. He lost his, uh, his fight with Lincoln and um, was um, ultimately between poverty, ill health, and um, old age. Um, he, um, he faded into obscurity. Um, one of his uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, justices under him, who quit because of Dred Scott, by the way, um, and who had all, many issues with Tawny, would, um, would later comment that um, uh, Tawny, like uh, uh, Justice Marshall, would have been considered um, the greatest of jurists in American history had it not been for Dred Scott. And so, George, we, we know the tragic outcome of uh, President Lincoln. Um, and, and there we see the, the long reach of Merriman. And, and just walk us through a little bit of that, because I, I want to ask you the, the final question, you know, for audiences tuning in today, um, you know, such a divisive time for our country. Uh, we see these two men at odds, you know, what should be the lessons if there's just one of them? Uh, or if there's just two of them, what would the lessons uh, that we should take away from today's discussion and examination of Lincoln and Tawny, what should that be? Okay, well, you can see on the screen, um, Merriman and 
the growth of presidential war powers in particular, but presidential powers um, uh, in general, leap dramatically under Lincoln. Um, he sees the, uh, uh, not necessarily the opportunity, but sees the necessity of um, uh, growth in presidential powers. So the takeaway, I guess, is the lasting impact of these extraordinary powers of a president in the time of national emergency, not even, I mean, can be and is short of war. Um, we can look at uh, today um, with the mere mention of um, President Trump um, uh, a couple days ago, and he didn't even use the term resurrection act, or, uh, not resurrection, I'm sorry, insurrection act. But um, it clearly, he was clearly pointing to it. And um, it sent a lot of shivers down the spine of not only his uh, Democratic and media opponents, but even some Republicans. Um, but it is true that the president does have extraordinary powers, has practiced extraordinary powers in extraordinary times. And so this ongoing tension between the branches of the government, again, we're seeing that play out today um, many of these stem from the, uh, the precedents set during the Civil War by um, Lincoln and his defiance of uh, the Chief Justice. And what a relevant lesson for now as we look at uh, the balance of the branches and, and their role in that discussion. Uh, clearly two historical figures that we could spend hours upon hours upon uh, studying and examining. You have done that as a great expert. Uh, George, we can't wait to get you back here again to talk about uh, Civil War in more depth, Lincoln in more depth, Taney in more depth, uh, perhaps even a look again at the Cuban Missile Crisis, all that you have to offer. But a big thank you for you to taking the time to join us for this Jefferson program today. Great. Um, and thank you all for watching. And thank you all for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. George, uh, real quick, for folks looking to connect uh, you know, with you, maybe to find out more about this presentation or uh, to connect with you to find out more about the Hagen History Center, uh, where should we point them? Well, um, those of you who may not be familiar with the term Hagen History Center, that is the uh, uh, new name which the Erie County Historical Society is using um, uh, to do business, even though we still are legally the Erie County Historical Society. Um, we have adopted the name the Hagen History Center. We are in the middle and would, if we could, um, uh, be open right now um, with eight beautiful new galleries. Um, I would invite people probably by August, we're going to have at least a soft opening of these new um, galleries at the Hagen History Center at 6th and Chestnut Street. Um, uh, Ben, I don't know if you can um, put up an email for me or perhaps tag my, uh, my email. Let's see, do I have it on here? No, I don't. So what um, we'll do is we'll make sure we add that in the comment section for this video. Uh, we'll also have that available on our website and we'll have a link to the Hagen History Center, uh, the newly rebranded uh, Erie County Historical Society. Uh, George, we're looking forward to that uh, opening uh, and we're looking forward to connecting again with you very soon. Uh, and of course, folks, for more information about upcoming programs and past programs at the Jefferson, as well as a whole host of publications, head over to our website, uh, www.jeserie.org, and you'll find information about uh, the Hagen History Center there. We'll pass along that. And of course, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We'll have more information for you there as well. Uh, for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for learning with us today.